right, today's scripture reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard from crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. So part of uh, Pastor Casey's invitation to me was uh, the, he explained kind of where you guys are in this, uh, this sermon series, Epic Road Trip, and he said um, it would be great if you could sort of pick up where, where we left off. So for those of you who haven't been hearing what, what they're doing, this Epic Road Trip is uh, a trip through Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is, is a list of all the great heroes of the faith and all that God had done through them, all the great and wonderful things that um, because of their faith they were able, able to do in Christ. And it is a, a great road trip because they're certainly uh, the characters that are listed there skip all over the Bible. And in fact, we're going to do that a little even today as we talk about the next person on the list, which is Moses. We're going to talk about uh, Moses and what he was able to do by faith. I've read through this chapter a number of times, and uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically a list. Uh, it starts off by, by saying um, these are the people who have ha had confidence in the hope we have in, in God's promises, and then just starts listing people and what they've done. And uh, uses the phrase by faith quite a few times. In fact, 21 times in chapter 11, it's listed by faith. And, you know, it's all the biblical greats are in there, uh, this person that's done this great thing and this person that's done this great thing. And I tell you what, when I read this chapter, usually what goes through my mind is sort of uh, just an overwhelming sense that these people have something and have done something that I could never do. You know, as I list through these uh, heroes of the Bible, I think to myself, um, uh, boy, I, I'm not holy enough to do what they did. I'm not righteous enough to accomplish what they've accomplished. My faith is not strong enough for God to use me as powerfully as he has used them. And in fact, this thought that, that I have um, where I sort of uh, disqualify myself from the list before I, I've even uh, engaged what, what, the re what the author is telling me um, we have to understand the purpose of this list is not to discourage us. It's actually not to disqualify us. It is to encourage us to put our faith in action. In order to, um, in order to see this, you actually have to go to the next chapter. The very beginning of chapter 12 explains the purpose of the list in chapter 11. The author of the book of Hebrews starts with the word, therefore. So he goes, here's all these people who have done all these great things, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the whole previous chapter, uh, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So the reason for the list in Hebrews 11 is to encourage us to run the race that our God has laid out for us and to show us that God can accomplish great things through anybody who just walks in faith. Faith is simply to believe that God's word is true, believe his promises are true, and to take that next step according to our calling. So what's holding us back? What's holding us back from, from doing great things in the kingdom of God? Well, um, I think it's that we keep ourselves from running that race by just saying we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, We've made too many mistakes. We just disqualify ourselves before we even finish. And I think there are five ways that we disqualify ourselves specifically, probably more, but five that I thought of for, for this morning. And I'm going to get into those five in just a second. But first, as we look at Moses and his ministry to God's people and his inclusion on this list should be very encouraging to us because he made a lot of mistakes. 
He, me he wasn't perfect. He messed up quite a few times. And so his inclusion on this list should be an encouragement to us that we too are not disqualified. So here's the first thing we do to disqualify ourselves. Number one, we say, I've sinned too bad or too much for God to use me in a powerful way. I have sinned too bad or too much to make a difference in the kingdom. And so we disqualify ourselves. Well, I don't know if you know uh, Moses' story, but um, he was actually adopted uh, by Pharaoh's family. And as he grew, there was this incident where he knew he was a Hebrew, even though he was being raised in an Egyptian family. And there was this, this incident where he saw um, an Egyptian guard mistreating uh, the, the other Israelites, the other Hebrews. And so um, he killed the guy who was mistreating them. Now, some people have said, well, this, this was righteous. This was God-pleasing because this guy was abusing God's people. Well, I don't think that's true. In fact, if you look at the text, it was premeditated revenge murder. That's what it was. He, it wasn't actually saving them from this mistreatment. He waited until there was nobody looking. The text says he looked this way and that way and nobody was there and then he murdered the guy. Okay, he didn't have the authority to do that. God says vengeance is mine, not ours to exact on others. And then he tried to cover it up. The text says he buried the guy in the sand. Okay, so this is Moses' background. He murdered a guy in cold blood. You know, it doesn't exactly say how he murdered him, but you can bet it was not pretty. Um, so if we look at Moses' history, uh, in his case, he didn't sin too badly or too much for God to call him to a great purpose, right? And this should encourage us that this doesn't disqualify us either. In fact, the truth is that your past sins do not disqualify you. Your past sins do not disqualify you. You might say, well, pastor, you don't know what I've done. Well, it, if you've murdered somebody, <laughs> it doesn't disqualify you according to Moses' story, right? There is no sin too bad or too much that's in our past that can say we are no longer qualified to serve God. We are no longer qualified to be on God's team. In fact, 1 John uh, 1, 9 says, it reminds us of this promise, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and pure us from all unrighteousness. This is God's promise. And it doesn't say that if we confess our sins, unless your sin is this, or unless your sin is that, that's way too much for Jesus to handle. No, it doesn't give any disqualifications. It just says a promise that God will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. So our past sins do not disqualify us, number one. Number two, we might disqualify ourselves by saying, I am not called by God. God has never appeared to me in any kind of burning bush and told me that there's a special purpose for me and sent me on any particular mission, right? So we doubt that we are in fact called by God to do great things in his kingdom. Well. Moses, if you, if you know that story, Moses um, uh, was out in the wilderness and he was, uh, something got his attention. There was a bush that was on fire, but he noticed the bush was not being burned up. There was a flame there, but the bush was not being burned up. So it got his attention, right? And he went over to the bush and then from the bush came the word of God. The word of God that called him to a special purpose. And I'm telling you right now that this is your burning bush moment. Because even though uh, God hasn't given us that, he has given us the church, and it is the church that gets our attention and delivers the word of God. So this right now is our burning bush moment, and I'm telling you, God has called you. And how do I know? Well, we already read the text. Hebrews 12, therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, throw off everything that hinders, the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, that is our calling. This is your burning bush moment, and now you have your special purpose to run the race that God has marked out for us. So how do I know what race God has marked out for us? Um, just to uh, give you a little example of how I think this sometimes works. Last week, many of you know, my grandfather passed away. And I was in Idaho uh, being with my family, uh, comforting especially my mother who lost her dad. And um, my grandfather had four kids, so my mom has three siblings. And this is the first time I've been uh, really actively involved in, in sort of um, 
putting a, a, a end cap on somebody's life. Um, I, there was my grandfather's house uh, that needed to be cleaned out. There was all his affairs that needed to be put in order. And um, my extended family was there. The house was packed. It was kind of chaotic. And I remember just being kind of lost, wanting to help, but not really knowing what to do. And I was just sitting on the couch, sort of watching the, the chaos going on. And there was, you know, too, too many chiefs and not enough Indians. So I just, uh, I just thought, I'll just, I'll just stay out of the way. So my mom comes to me and she says, um, in, a, in sort of a frustrated but loving voice, why aren't you helping? <laughs> That's what she said to me. And I went, uh, well, I don't know what to do. Everybody's running around. I just, I just don't know what to do. And she goes, ask. <laughs> if you don't know what to do, ask. If you don't have anything to do, just come to me. I will give you something to do. And I said, okay, how can I help? And I got a list, so... <laughs> I got a list. And I was able to, to plug in and, and help and care for my family in that moment. I think the church sometimes is that way for us too. Um, there's a lot to be done and we see people kind of running this way and that and, and we don't really know where we can plug in and so we just kind of sit down in the pew and, and do nothing else. Um, and so I'm here to encourage you, ask. Ask how you can help. You can go to one of the leaders of the church. You can go to any of your pastors. You can say, I really want to help. I really want to use my gifts. I really want to find out what race is marked out for me to make a difference in the kingdom. And I want your help telling me what needs to happen next. The church is the burning bush. God calls people to service through the church by his word. So let the leaders and pastors of your church help you with that. It's, I tell you, there's nothing more fun to me in the ministry than having somebody from the congregation say, I really want to help. Can you help me find a place to serve? And I, I'll give them a list. So, <laughs> so ask. So uh, don't disqualify yourself by saying, I am not called by God. The truth is that you are, in fact, called by God. You're called by the church and called by the word to serve. Um, so the next uh, excuse or the next disqualification that we often uh, give for ourselves is I'm not gifted or talented enough. I'm not gifted or talented enough to serve. Uh, you know, I, Moses kind of felt the same way. He, uh, when, when God gave him this special purpose, Moses said, well, I'm not, I'm not good at speaking. And I, I have to tell you, I sort of relate to Moses on this one because um, uh, I just was not a good public speaker when I first started. I don't, you know, however good I am now, I was much worse back then. And um, I remember uh, my congregation has actually heard this story, but I, uh, I'll tell the rest of you, that um, my very first sermon was in uh, my uh, internship church, and the pastor there had given me the opportunity to speak to the people. And I remember during the song that was right before the message where I was supposed to stand up and deliver, I looked over to the side and I saw an emergency exit. And I, was, I literally had to, you know, going through my mind, exit, uh, podium, exit, podium. And, and I had to make that choice. No, I'm, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do it. So then afterward, I asked my uh, supervising pastor, um, what'd you think? And no joke, his answer was, I think you can do better. <laughs> that was his answer. And I'm going to help you do better. So, uh, you know, it's, I, I was not gifted to do what I was called to do initially, so I certainly sympathize with Moses. Um, but if you look at Exodus 3 and 4, which is the, the ch two chapters with Moses' calling in it, he offers five lame excuses. Five lame excuses. And my guess is that they, some of them will sound familiar because they're lame excuses that we use also. But um, so God tells him, I'm going to have you go and talk to Pharaoh on my behalf. And his first lame excuse is, well, who am I? His first lame excuse is, who am I? What he meant was, I'm not important. I'm not, you know, worthy. Who am I? And interestingly enough, God's answer was, I'm paraphrasing, but it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am. That's what God said. It doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am. Um, so that was uh, his, his first lame excuse. It doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am. I will be with you, he says. The second lame excuse he gives is, well, who are you? You know, you say you'll be with me, but, but who are you? And, and God's answer is, I'm Yahweh, which in Hebrew means I am and I always will be. It means I'm God. It means I created everything. You want to know who I am? That's who I am. 
And he said, okay, so that was his second lame excuse. <laughs> his third lame excuse is, well, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe me? And he's, Jesus, or God's um, answer to that in a nutshell is, my power will go with you. My power will go with you. And he gives three examples of how his power will go with him. He says, your staff, you throw it on the ground, it's going to turn into a snake. And then when you pick it up again, it's going to turn it into a staff again. This is proof that my power is with you. Then take your hand and put it in your cloak. You're going to pull it out. It's going to be covered in leprosy. You're going to put it back in and pull it out again, and it's going to be clean. That is a sign that my power is with you. And finally, if they don't believe you, then go to the river, pour out some uh, water of the river Nile, and I'll turn it into blood. And these three things will be proof to them and to you that my power is with you. So that's his third lame excuse. Fourth, he says, I don't talk no good. That, that's <laughs> paraphrasing too, but he says, I don't talk no good. What are you calling me for? And God's answer to him again was, I will help you. I will give you what you need uh, to accomplish this calling. And finally, this, I'll read this one word for word because I love it. It's uh, chapter 4, verse 13, his final lame excuse. But Moses said, after all of this, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. <laughs> That's how he ends. He goes, well, you know, I've, I've laid out all of my objections and none of it has been good enough, so now I'm asking you, please send someone else. And, and God says, um, he, the text says that this made God angry, right? Uh, and in his anger, he cared for Moses and actually gave him some help. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to ask somebody else because I'm asking you. But what I am going to do is I'm going to give you some help. And when Aaron comes, he can help you, all right? So in God's anger, he acted in love and grace towards Moses and gave him some help. And none of Moses' lame excuses were, were good enough for God. And so um, I'm wondering then, what are some of our lame excuses when God calls us? I'm not smart enough. I'm not outgoing enough. I'm not articulate. I don't know enough about the Bible. I can't sing. I'm not as energetic as Pastor Casey. But in truth, who is, right? Uh, you know, these are all our lame excuses. And God answers each one of us the same way he answers Moses. I am God. I will be with you. My power will be with you. I will help you, and I will give you help. You know, those five answers will cover any lame excuses that we can come up with, so we have no excuse to say I'm not gifted or not talented enough. And the truth is, God gifts you according to your calling. God gifts you according to your calling. So whatever he's called you to do, he will give you everything you need to do it. Uh, so lame excuse or disqualification number four, I'm too weak, I'm too old, I'm too sick, or I'm too tired. I'm too weak, I'm too old, I'm too sick, or I'm too tired. Uh, if you remember, uh, uh, Moses came to uh, different points where his strength ran out, his um, his weakness showed, and uh, it affected the ministry to the Israelites. If you remember the story from uh, Exodus 7, the Amalekites attacked the Israelites. And Moses went up on a hill, and he kept his arms outstretched over the battle, and the Israelites recognized as long as Moses' arms are outstretched, we're winning. But when he gets too tired and weak and his arms fall down, we start losing. So we need to help him. And they actually brought a rock for him to sit on, and uh, two guys, uh, Aaron and Hur, actually held his arms up so that they could win the battle. So at this point, Moses was getting old. He was too weak to do what they needed him to do, and so others came along and, and held him up. Um, so I don't know if, if many of you know this, but uh, I, uh, my congregation knows, but I, I was diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's a few years ago. And um, my dad has it, uh, you know, I've seen how to deal with it, I'm not worried, um, 
but it does, uh, it's a degenerative disorder, which means my capacity to do this work will diminish as time goes on. And I've seen it uh, over the last couple years. I just have less energy, uh, just um, less uh, focus and so on. And, um, uh, you know, when I first got diagnosed with it, I, I, the thought did occur to me, maybe I should step aside and let somebody more capable do this because, um, you know, I just wrestle with the reality that my capacity to do this job is, is diminishing. And um, it was actually this story that uh, really encouraged me to, um, to engage the calling that I have, to take that next step of faith, to persevere, run the race that God has laid out for me, because um, it's true that our weakness does not disqualify us. Your weakness does not disqualify you from serving God. So uh, just to run back through them really quick, your sin does not disqualify you. Uh, you do have a calling. Um, God will gift you as he calls you, and you are not uh, too weak or um, too sick or too old or too tired to engage in, in God's calling. Number five, finally, I have tried to serve God and made mistakes and suffered the consequences. So you might say, well, I've tried to serve God in the past and I kind of made a mess of it. I kind of uh, screwed up and I had to suffer the consequences for it. So certainly uh, that disqualifies me. Well, um, a very similar thing happened to Moses, in fact, in Numbers chapter 20. So uh, this is um, a little bit of history here. God gave the Israelites, uh, when they were dying of thirst in the wilderness, a rock. If you remember this rock. And out of the rock came water. And this water uh, enabled them to survive in the wilderness. And the, the rock actually came with them. And 1 Corinthians 10 actually talks about this rock. Paul says, they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. The rock was actually an incarnation of God's promise. He was showing the Israelites that there will be one who will come from whom the spring of life will give life to all people. And so the rock was Christ, the image of Christ to God's people. Now, there was uh, two times that Moses was given instructions in order to get water to come from the rock. The first time, God told him to strike the rock with his staff. And the purpose of that was to foreshadow the crucifixion of Christ, that God's uh, people would beat him and hang him on a cross. And then the second time, God told Moses, speak to the rock. Don't strike it. Speak to the rock. And the purpose of that was to show God's people that his crucifixion was sufficient for that water to keep flowing whenever we ask, whenever we ask. So Moses was charged with a pretty big responsibility. He was to demonstrate through this gift of the rock who, which God's promise to come, which was Christ, and he messed up. He actually, the second time, struck the rock again, and then he took credit for the water that came out. He hit the rock again, taking credit for the water that came out. And God said, you, that's not what I asked you to do. You have messed up the imagery that I was trying to convey to our people. You have uh, tainted the, um, the prophecy and the foreshadowing of Christ. It was a big mistake. And so his earthly consequence was that he was no longer allowed into the promised land. That he had led his people all the way to that point, but it would not be him that brought them into the promised land. A pretty big consequence. Well, you might say, a mistake like that and a consequence like that, certainly he is now disqualified. But in fact, he's not. In fact, we know that he's not because he appears um, as one of the two heroes of the faith on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? It was Moses and Elijah. And his inclusion in this list as somebody who did great things by faith in Hebrews 11 proves to us again that he was not disqualified. So even when we try to serve God and make mistakes and suffer the consequences, we are still not disqualified. So um, just a, a real quick example. Um, Martha, my wife, who's right here, and I, uh, we're at a ministry conference. And the ministry conference, um, uh, 
wanted uh, to minister to all the church workers that were there, all the pastors, and uh, they said, we have free counseling available. And some guys were there with their wives, including me, and um, they said, well, listen, even if you think you don't need it, we really encourage you to go and, and just um, ex be encouraged by our counselors. It's free. They're there for you. Please take advantage. So my wife and I said, let's, let's, do, let's go. And we went, and um, uh, it was very helpful, but I was really struck by the counselor's story that he told us, which um, is really a remarkable example of this, uh, of this disqualification that we think. Um, and he said, uh, I used to be a pastor of a fairly large church, and I really messed up. I had an affair. And uh, it was found out, and um, I was uh, removed from my position. And he said, at that moment, I knew my first priority was to reconcile with my wife, to rebuild the trust that I had broken, to try and get past this betrayal in order to not miss out on this gift of our marriage that God has given us. And he said, um, by the grace of God, we were able to reconnect. She was able to forgive me, and we are closer now than we've ever been, praise God. And now I have this calling to counsel and help other couples. And I thought, man, what a great example of how we're not disqualified by our mistakes. And he suffered some pretty severe earthly consequences, and it just shows that God was not done with him. He re-engaged him in the kingdom of God to do great and wonderful things. And he was able to help m my wife and I and a bunch of other couples because he went through that experience. So I've tried to serve, made mistakes, and suffered consequences does not disqualify you. And here's the truth. Your mistakes and the earthly consequences you suffer do not disqualify you. Um, there's a, a saying that the Navy SEALs use that goes, you are never out of the fight. You are never out of the fight. And what they mean is no matter how beat up or bruised or wounded or tired you are, uh, there's always one more thing that you can do. And if you're not dead, you're never out of the fight. And, and that's, you know, I think a picture of, of the Christian within the context uh, of the church and our calling for God. We're never kicked off the team. We're never disqualified because of our sin. The, only thing that qualifies us is our faith in Christ. If we reject that, then the race is lost. But if we believe God's promises, which is what faith is, and we take that next step in whatever race God has marked out for us, then he can too accomplish great things through us. Um, so what qualifies us? Our, our faith in Christ. Why? Because even though we've done a lot of stuff to try and disqualify ourselves, he ran the race for us, and, and we get to receive uh, the award that, that he won on our behalf, which is the cross. So faith in Christ is, is what qualifies us. Um, so, you know, you and I will never be included on this uh, list in Hebrews 11, obviously. Uh, but what I am looking forward to is the promise that when we walk by faith, uh, God, when we go to see him on that last day, will commend us with these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, you might think, well, I'm, I'm not worthy of being called good and faithful because of all these ways that I've messed up, but that's, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about for those of us who walk by faith in Christ to receive the good, gracious gifts of his love and forgiveness and to allow God to work through us to accomplish great things, that is a good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let, me, uh, let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for the list of those who did great things by faith in Hebrews 11. Help us not to look at that list and disqualify ourselves. Help us not to look at that list and think that they have so much more than we have. In fact, we have the same that they have. We have you. Help us to be encouraged to run the race that you have marked out for us. Help us to be encouraged by your love and grace and forgiveness. Also, Lord, reveal that next step in our walk to each and every one of us. And if we need help identifying it, please help us to seek out those 
that can give us that. Help us to seek out those in the church who can guide us according to your will. And Lord God, we pray that um, through us, your mission would be accomplished and that we would hear your great commission to go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that you have commanded. Lord God, we just give you thanks and praise for this wonderful gift that is our service here today. You know, these moments are sometimes fleeting, and we pray you just help us to enjoy them, to bask in your goodness and provision. We pray that as we are in the company of the saints, that we would be an encouragement to one another. Lord God, we ask that you would uh, continue to use Trinity and the Avenue Church in our community to bless others, that those who don't know us would come to know you through our efforts, that others would be blessed, and that the suffering in our city would be lessened because of our faithfulness, Lord God. And so, Lord God, we uh, just ask for all of these things and ask for your blessing on our communities today. And we ask that you would bless everything that we do in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So in uh, the Trinity's worship service, um, we typically, uh, uh, towards the end of the service, we'll pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. If you remember in the scriptures, the disciples asked, Lord, when we pray, how should we do that? And he gives us uh, the Lord's prayer. So I invite you to stand as we pray that prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You can have a seat. I actually uh, went over this message with uh, Pastor Mitch and asked if he would give us a little testimony about how God has, has worked out the things that we've talked about in his own life. So I'll take, awesome. hand it over to him. Thanks, Pastor Vince. Yeah, big hand. <clears throat> it, it certainly is an honor and a privilege to stand up. I'm going to give you a little bit of my testimony. Uh, some of you or many of you have probably heard it, but uh, I didn't get to this place um, probably as you maybe have thought or would think uh, to become a pastor. And so if past sins, weaknesses, lack of gifts, abilities, and continued struggles disqualified people from God's calling on their lives, then I certainly wouldn't be standing before you today. We serve a God of second chances, do we not? And third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances. Hallelujah. Today I, yeah, today I get to serve as one of the pastors here at the Avenue Church and it is an honor and a privilege, but 12 years ago, you wouldn't have found me anywhere near a church, unless, of course, there was a wedding and a party afterwards, and then maybe you would have found me there. I would have been there. I didn't believe in Jesus, wanted nothing to do with him, and uh, I thought people who did were wasting their time. I was very selfish and foolish for many years, squandered many years of my life. I was all about me and what made me happy and how I could find joy, whether that was alcohol, drugs, sex, it didn't matter. Although being raised by a couple loving parents, both my mother and father loved me dearly, I started drinking at a young age, 14 or 15 years old, started finding joy or what I thought was joy in alcohol and um, consequences quickly came. I quickly found myself in trouble with the law on multiple occasions and was kicked off athletics for a semester at the school. In college, you can only imagine it ran off to the races, right? My addiction really took over. And this is where drugs were introduced into my story. And so cocaine and marijuana and pretty much anything else that was around, I was in and I was for all about it. Blackouts were a very normal part of my routine, right? I would lose hours and hours of time, sleeping with random women, waking up in strange places, frequently placing myself in incredibly dangerous situations, not to mention all the incredibly stupid and foolish things I did and said. When anybody comes to you and says, do you remember what you did last night, right? You, you always say no, and I don't want to hear it either, right? I'm not interested. After I graduated from college in 2000, I moved to South Florida and I continued on with the partying. I managed to keep jobs. I was a functional alcoholic addict 
manage to keep jobs and even excel in some ways, but the path was destructive nonetheless. I worked in the restaurant business here in Delray Beach. I was a general manager of a restaurant. And in the restaurant business, many of you probably know, it is completely okay to excessively drink and drug in most restaurants. And so even though I was a general manager, it was completely okay. And by God's grace, I survived. I wasn't killed or seriously injured. God sustained my life. And unbeknownst to me, he was orchestrating something really beautiful and wonderful. Some minor issues related to drinking, but nothing serious until the morning of July 7, 2007. I was arrested here in Delray Beach for felony possession of cocaine by the Delray Beach Police Department. God intervened in my life that fateful day. I remember thinking this is the worst thing that could ever happen to me, right? This is the worst day ever. But as I look back, I see God's hands all over it, right? He had planned that. He had drawn that up. He was... He had pointed that fateful day for me to get arrested. Shortly after that, I entered into the drug court program here in Palm Beach County, and I successfully graduated, expunging my felony possession of cocaine. And it was through this process of doing the drug court that I found hope in Christ. The Lord awoke in my heart to his very presence. See, I didn't even believe in his presence to that point. I was incredibly desperate. I had attained... At this point, some material things, like I said, I had a house and some different things that I thought would bring me joy and happiness, but I was more miserable, scared, and hopeless than I ever had been before. It was at this low point that my sponsor actually introduced me to Jesus Christ. Nothing has been the same ever since. Today, I have a beautiful wife and a gorgeous young son. I met her at the church. I get to experience true joy for the first time in my life as I found Jesus. Lasting peace was a part of my story now. Found purpose for my life, that which he created me for. God is so amazing, is he not? God, instead of disqualifying me for my past, actually uses it. My past has, in many ways, qualified me more than others to minister to others in need. I find myself ministering all the time to those in addiction. I get to share experiences that others don't have. And so God actually uses it. He actually has qualified me in many ways to minister to others. I actually started a Christian halfway house, a sober home when I first got sober for men and women. And hundreds of men were introduced to Jesus Christ through that ministry. God has also chosen me to serve him in some other amazing places. I have the pleasure of serving for a couple years as a chaplain for the Delray Beach Police Department, the same department that arrested me for felony possession of cocaine. Yes, thank you, Jesus. I'm honored to serve on the executive board of the Palm Beach County Substance Awareness Coalition Board, and I currently sit on boards that oversee multiple local new churches, including one in Haiti. I say all that not to boast in me, but to boast in Christ and Christ alone, because I would not have chose any of those things, believe me. It would have been the last thing on my list. But there's nothing that can separate us from God's love, nothing. Don't allow the enemy or others to condemn you for your past. If you place your trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross, then you have been forgiven, and he desires to do great things in you and through you. See, the truth of the gospel is that Jesus took those sins upon himself. He has paid for your shame, your regrets, and the pain you have caused yourself and those that you've hurt along the way. He's taken that upon himself. That is amazing, but there is so much more. He has also paid for your sins you will commit today, this afternoon, and the ones you'll commit in the future, right? His cross is sufficient. As God the Father looks at you today, believe it or not, he is well pleased in you, no matter what you have done. That is the truth. This may be hard for some of you to swallow this morning, but it's the truth. When God looks at you because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, he sees you as his only son, Jesus, perfect and spotless. He delights, in fact, in you. He sings and dances over you, it says in Zephaniah. Allow that grace to saturate your hearts this morning and your minds always. And as you do this, you will intuitively walk out the calling 
upon your life. Pastor Vince spoke secondly that Moses was disqualified by a lack of gifts. When I first got sober, I was incredibly insecure. There is no way you'd get me on a stage. I couldn't even imagine speaking in public. Part of the particular calling was here to be a pastor at the Avenue Church. What did I know of pastoral ministry? Never had a seminary class, never went to seminary. God, why me? I had the lame question, God, why me, was my question. Every time they'd ask me, Casey or anybody else, you want to be on the board of directors? You want to be an elder? I think you have a call to be a pastor. Nope, you got the wrong guy, right? But the good, awesome, and amazing thing about being in a fellowship of a community of believers is that other people get to see in you your calling before you get to see it in yourself oftentimes, and they call it out of you. They pull you forward. They take you along. And so I thank God for the men at the Avenue Church. When I didn't believe in myself and I didn't see the calling, they saw the calling in me and they called me forth, right? And I get to serve in this way now. So for those of you out here that feel like you're disqualified for whatever you've done in your past or you have a lack of ability, be of good cheer. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called I'll read that again. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Almost every character in the Bible blows it at some point. And not just kind of blows it, but really blows it. Jacob was a cheater. David had an affair and had an, someone murdered to cover it up. Noah got drunk. Certainly can uh, relate with Noah. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. Miriam was a gossip. Martha was a warrior. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Moses stuttered. Abraham was old. And Lazarus was, in fact, dead. <laughs> but not even death would stop God's calling upon Lazarus. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. So we'll, in just a few minutes, we're going to have prayer partners come up. I would like for the Avenue Church and Trinity for your prayer partner team to come on up on either side that we will receive people who have prayer requests. We certainly want to pray for you this morning. Just remember, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ. If you've committed your life to Jesus, there's nothing that will ever disqualify you. What is holding you back this morning? What is it for you? What is keeping you from accomplishing the things that God desires for you today and in your future? Is it your age? Some of you may think you're too young. Some of you may think you're too old. Well, you know what? God's army doesn't discriminate by age. He takes the young and the old. Maybe it's fear of what others think. Any of you have fear of what others may think of you? Insecurities and fears? I did. God takes those. He absorbs those. His grace is sufficient for your fear. Maybe it's comfort. Maybe some of you are just afraid that it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. This thing that he's been tugging at your heart to walk out in faith to do, it is going to be hard. No doubt about it, but it will be worth it, I promise you. And so step out in faith. Maybe you're, not, you're just not simply sure of what the next step of obedience is. Maybe the prayer partners can work that through with you this morning. Whatever it is that's holding you back, put it to death by the power of our resurrected Savior. What does God desire for you? God desires the allegiance of your heart. And when you allow him to be Lord of your life, you will live out the calling on your life. He has placed his very spirit within you to guide and direct you on his path for his glory. I don't want to overcomplicate this this morning. God is simply looking for those who are willing to follow him. There's an old quote by Brother Andrew that says, God does not choose people because of their ability, but because of their availability. Are you available today for God's calling upon your life? And so as we close this morning, we're going to close in song. And so I just want to invite you, if the Lord is tugging on your heart, maybe you haven't committed your life to Jesus, right? Maybe this morning you want to commit your life to Jesus. Come up and receive prayer. We have prayer partners waiting for you. Come on up now. We're going to go ahead and play out one last song. And as you leave after the song is done and you're dismissed.